uh, the ratings are in, and I asked Steve Ducey about it. I said, Steve, how do we do? And he said, this is huge. Oh, really? Huh, interesting. So uh, first day on Tuesday, um, here's what we did. It's, it's not, not a big deal. It's not a big deal. But uh, we went ahead and beat Sienna. And, in fact, I think we beat him with a stick, if I'm not mistaken. This is, I asked a friend of mine, and he said, this is what you should do to him. What to do? You take them out of the office and hit them with a stick a couple times. They will do. They will do. And it turns out they did. <laughs> okay. So, first uh, day out, not a big deal. Rick Sanchez is on at 4 o'clock at CNN. He's a good guy, etc. Elbow from the sky. What happened? What happened? Right? And uh, the second day, though, I mean, come on. Look, can you do it two days in a row? Of course, of course you can. Beat uh, CNN by nearly forty percent, nearly forty percent in the adults twenty five fifty four demo. Okay, that's what in TV they call the money demo. <laughs> We're gonna change that. To, it's the money demo, Lebowski. Okay, so the ratings came in awesome. Oh, listen, hold on. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. Look, seriously, I can't thank you guys enough because it ain't me. I'm, I didn't watch it. You watched it, right? And as people looked at the numbers, they're like, oh, my God, the TYT Army is too strong. But that's what I've been telling you. That's what I've been trying to communicate to you. They think we're kidding around out here. <laughs> you know, a lot of people on TV, they don't believe the Internet is real. They, they think, oh, well, you got, you know, 600,000 views a day, whatever. That doesn't really count. Well, part of it doesn't count. They're real human beings. They watch the damn thing. What do you want? So then when you do it on TV, all of a sudden people pay attention. So what, what happened there? Who dropped the elbow on Rick Sanchez's head? What happened? That poor son of a bitch still still bleeding out there, man. Somebody get him some help. Get a sponge. Sponge. Mop that thing up. All right. Oh, by the way, headline news. Oh, come on, come on, please. Come on. Come on, headline news. Come on. All right, give me a week. I'll come after Fox. <laughs> come on, Fox. I'm coming for you coming. And from what I understand, I got the TYT army behind me. Oh, God. Thank you, guys. Seriously, man. For all of you guys who watch and you got other people to watch. You know what our marketing budget is? I don't know if people know this. Our marketing budget is zero dollars and zero cents. Okay, you're our marketing budget. So, without you guys getting the word out, of course, that uh, wouldn't have happened. And God bless your hearts. Be and I'll tell you why it's important. It's because if you do well in the ratings, you get more opportunities. The more opportunities you get, the more you get to tell people the truth on uh, television. I mean, that's what we're after, right? To reach a bigger audience and to reach the people in Washington and shake them out of their complacency. And look at the, some of the segments we did on Radigan's program. And God bless Dylan Radigan uh, for asking me to sub in and his producers who did a great job, et cetera, et cetera, right? So uh, we did a... Uh, a segment questioning whether uh, the political spectrum has moved to the right. Now, people watch that in Washington, they're like, really? It's moved to the right? And in the, earlier, uh, in the first day, we did Obama versus Reagan. Who's more conservative? I got a blog up about that right now on theyoungturks.com. I said, so who's more conservative, right? And they, uh, you look at it and you're like, oh, Ronald Reagan gave amnesty to illegal immigrants. I mean, you know how JR always talks about projection? You look at what Ronald Reagan did. And it's exactly what conservatives now warn liberals are all about. Giving amnesty, uh, negotiating with terrorists, uh, trading arms for hostages, uh, negotiating without uh, preconditions, raising taxes. I mean, the list goes on and on. So you do a segment like that, people are like, so what? Oh, yeah, that's an interesting point, don't it? By the way, throughout the show, especially on the second day, the numbers kept getting larger and larger and larger. They're like the TYT Army. It's building and building and building. What's going on here? So, all right, listen, love you guys. And here's another re reason I know it's not me. This morning, I'm getting ready, and I have a, a kind of a long uh, faucet on my sink. It go, one of those things that comes up and then comes down, right? I don't know why they ever make them like that, right? So I'm getting ready, and I had to sneeze. I said, ah, sick it. And I hit my head on the faucet. I was like, I said, oh, shit. oh, geez, and Lord mercy. Oh. <laughs> okay. It ain't me, man. It ain't me. Uh, but thank you for getting me the opportunity to tell, talk a little truth and pull more people in. Uh, we love you guys for it. All right. So now let's do the show. Um, 
I, let me start with Hannity because Angle is going to make me mad. Uh, so Sean Hannity is going to uh, be talking to a guy named Ibrahim Rami. He is with the Muslim American Society. So-called controversy is about NASA Administrator Charles Bolden uh, reaching out to Muslims by saying uh, that we have to find a way to reach out to the Muslim world as a quote and engage much more with a dominantly Muslim nations to help them feel good about their historic contribution to science and math and engineering, which is true. Uh, Arabs uh, historically have uh, done great contributions to math, science, etc. Right? So I, I don't even understand what the objection is. Uh, as usual, conservatives, their initial objection is, ah, that's a fact. Yeah, I don't like it. Right? So, okay, apparently there's some controversy about that. Are, are the right-wingers in this country afraid of Muslims in space? What are they going to do up there? I don't know. Okay, so now here comes Hannity, and uh, let's see what his thoughts on it are. I, I, I have a hard time with the president's, quote, outreach to the Muslim community in this way. When he spoke to the Muslim world, he didn't talk about America's contributions to Kuwait. He didn't talk about America's contributions to Kosovo. He didn't talk about America's contributions to um, Indonesia uh, or Iraq. That doesn't the, uh, I, I don't hear America being praised enough by the Muslim world. Does the Muslim world give America the credit it's due? Yeah, I think. Go, 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 go. <laughs> All right. And he went on to answer the question in a serious manner. But you don't answer that question seriously. The praise that uh, they're doing. I, I don't know why the Muslim world would ever be upset with America. They should be, you know, on their hands and knees thanking us for helping, for example, giving $3 billion a year to Israel, uh, which continues to expand settlements in the occupied territories and so far has not given the Palestinians a state in over 40 years. Now, look, I, you could say, hey, we're in the right there. And that's a, okay, legitimate, I don't agree, but that's a legitimate opinion to have. But you can't pretend that Muslims should be happy about that. Like, oh, thank you for helping Israel not to give us a state. We really appreciate it. Way to look out for us. And then there's that small matter of the Iraq invasion, where by most estimates, over 100,000 civilians died. Civilians, right? Uh, the Iraqis, I know, we, they should be thanking us for their freedom. Uh, by the way, we also started a civil war. Millions were displaced outside the country, inside the country. We caused enormous havoc there. And, but they should be, we, the Muslims should be thanking America. Uh, and then the list goes on. And then, gee, I wonder why some Muslims would be antagonistic towards people on Fox News when... Uh, conservatives on Fox News and other places have vilified Islam uh, in general. They've called uh, Muslims, quote, psychotics. Uh, some have said that we're uh, not at war with fundamentalist Islam, we're at war with all of Islam. Okay? Gee, I wonder why they would be upset. Well, if all of that wasn't, and about, how about Hannity? Well, I'm sure Hannity's never said anything like that. Yeah, except for that time that he compared the Quran to what he called, quote, the Nazi Bible, Mein Kampf. Gee, it's weird that uh, the Muslims haven't sent over thank you cards and roses to Sean Hannity of Fox News Channel. Thank you so much for being so great to us. And they say it with a straight face. That's the amazing part. All right. So that, that's, well, we're just getting warms up. Oh, by the way, before I go on to share an angle, I should make a quick note. You know, I'm kidding around about Rick Sanchez, right? But he's actually a good guy. And... I mean, he's one of the few guys who actually did those stories, and we shared them with you here, uh, where he traced lobbyist money and which politicians it went to and whether that might affect our votes. Of course it affects our votes, but it was nice. It was good work, and he goes after Fox uh, on occasions too. So, well, bless his heart. It's nothing personal. I, we just, he was the guy against us, so we had to beat his ass. And nothing personal at all, okay? <laughs> okay, I got to calm down. <laughs> all right, anyway, um, so Sharon Angle. Now, Sharon Angle is running against Harry Reid in Nevada. Uh, she's a Tea Party lady, and uh, she beat the mainstream Republican. And so the Tea Party people think, oh, yeah, we got Harry Reid on the run. No, you don't. You got yourself on the run because you picked a crazy lady. And, uh, you know, she said many uh, atrocious things in the past. We've told you about them, specifically on the issue of abortion. Uh, she had said earlier that, hey, look, if you get raped or um, uh, you're the victim of incest, well, that was God's plan. You should keep the baby anyway. And it's not you should keep the baby. If Sharon Angle was in charge, you would have to keep the baby. Because, look, if you think it's part of God's plan that you got raped and impregnated, 
okay, I, look, that seems strange to me, right? But I don't believe what you believe. And, you know, if that's what you think and I'm going to bring this kid into the world, in a lot of ways, I actually admire that. And if you want to make that choice, God bless your heart. I get that. But it's a different thing entirely when you mandate it on everybody else. Now, if you thought that earlier statement was bad, she's asked about it again on another radio program. And they said, really? I mean, rape and incest. And the host asked, a 13-year-old raped by their own dad? And the host is conservative. I don't know if he's on her side or not, but he's pressing her on this issue, which is good. And he says, now, would you make her keep it? She says, yeah. And did, I, did I stutter? And that's, she didn't say it in that way, but I'm going to give you a direct quote in a second. She said, no, no, look, I am in favor of the pro-life position no matter what and then here comes the quote she said well if you get lemons you should make lemonade oh man imagine because look when I see stuff like that the reason I get angry is because I, th I it's always personal to me like not a personal attack against me but I always envision it like my god if that's happened to someone I loved and then this bitch comes in here and tells her to make lemonade out of it? Someone you love, just picture it. And it gets raped. And says, no, I don't want to have this kid. She says, no, 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 shut up. It's God's plan. You don't get to make that choice. God already made that choice for you by having this man rape you. Whether it's in the case of incest, whether it's your father or your uncle when you're underage, or whether it's a stranger or whoever it is. It's part of, Sharon Angle has decided it's part of God's plan. And so, hey, you know what? Make lemons out of lemonade. I'm sorry, lemonade out of lemons. I can't, look, I'm already angry enough as it is, but if she said that to someone I cared about to their face and then made them carry that child, I mean, I can't imagine the anger. No, 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 no. It isn't your choice. It isn't your choice to talk to your God and tell me what you think he said about what we should do with our bodies. And after such a traumatic event like that, whether you're underage or you're not, whether it's a family member or not, to, for somebody to come up and say, oh, well, basically, suck it up. Make lemonade out of it. Ha, ha, ha. Make something positive out of your own rape. Does it get any more atrocious? Look, even if you believe that, for the love of God, don't say it that way. Say, oh, you know, there's, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to defend your insane position. But I don't say make lemonade out of lemons. That's despicable. So now, see, that's the other thing about Republicans. You're so damn stupid. You had Harry Reid in a corner. I mean, he was in so much trouble. An incumbent is in trouble if they're under 50%. He was under 40%. You had him on the ropes. And what'd you do? You let him out of there. And look, I, I don't have a horse in that race. You know, I get so mad at Harry Reid often, but I don't want him to lose to somebody crazier, right? And I always say, look, you got to be practical. And if I had to go into a voting booth and those are my two choices, I'm not going to vote for the Republican. Hell no, in those circumstances, right? But Republicans, if you care about it, you had him on the ropes, and what'd you do? You <laughs> selected him psychotic. She also said today about the $20 billion fund that BP has to pay into, oh, it's a slush fund. Like somehow the government's going to take that money, and ha, 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 and they shouldn't have taken BP's money. Poor BP. You let him off the hook, man. I mean, you know, I complained about Harry Reid, ironically, and, and Barack Obama giving him the queen. Oh, by put, picking Sharon Angle, you just gave the Democrats and Harry Reid your queen, your bishop, your knight, your pawns, and said, okay, let's get started now. Look, if she wins, then I, I feel sad for the state of Nevada because, I mean, she's crazy in 18 different ways. But I don't think she's going to win. I think these comments are way over the top, and, uh, and you let Harry Reid off the hook. So, uh, hey, you know what? It, if you want to keep going that way, all right, keep electing crazier and crazier right-wingers and see how that works out for you. People are talking about how the Republicans might take back the Senate. Look, the House is a totally different situation because there's different macro-micro uh, analysis that you do if it's the House or the Senate. Very complicated, right? But the Senate is more, okay, this guy versus that guy. And it's very clear. There's a lot of attention paid to it. It's on a state uh, basis, so more people know about it. 
Uh, a lot of this stuff is national attention, so it's more scrutinized. There's a lot of press around it. You think you're going to get the Senate back by having these lunatics run? They, they're not getting the Senate back. That's crazy talk. They'd have to win all of their races, and they're not going to win races by having people like this run. Have at it, Hoss. All right. What am I going to do? Now, look, by, one last thing. I would prefer that they had rational Republicans run to give us a real choice. Okay, would I be open-minded to that? Of course I would. Well, why, why wouldn't I want a choice? It's like when we had the debate about the public option or not. Well, do you want the public option? Yeah, it's an option. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I'd like to have a shot at it. Would I like sane Republicans? Of course I'd like sane Republicans, because maybe they'll be right about it some things. They're, in a lot of ways, they're right about Freddie, uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Not that they caused the economic crisis, but that they're in terrible shape and should basically be shut down. The Republicans are right about that. If you give me a sane Republican who's running on sane policies, we're having a conversation. You give me lunatics, and we have no choice. And it makes it easier on the Democrats, in my opinion, to sell out to corporate America, because they collect the cash, and then they don't have to worry about opposition because they're running against the madmen. All right, we'll come right back. All right, well, the Young Toast, we've got a power hour ahead for you guys. Richard Escow here from Huffington Post and a Nightlight. Ben Mankiewicz here uh, from The Young Turks, Turner Classic Movies, and just about everything else. Stephen A. Smith Show on Fridays. <laughs> Twitter? <laughs> Twitter, yeah. Uh, ben Mank, 77? Right. Okay, we Start pushed that today. today. Yeah, all right. Six hours. All right, nicely done. So, um, I want to talk about a lot of things about uh, first, uh, are the Republicans going to switch their position on Afghanistan? That might be a real issue. Uh, what are we going to do with the Republicans' $200 million war chest that they uh, apparently have collected? How do you fight back against that? But first, I want to start talking about uh, Richard's piece uh, that he, you have on Huffington Post today about Freed Zachariah, because it's not really about him. It's about the Washington bubble. So first, tell us what, what your thesis was, and then we'll discuss. Well, the background is that uh, Fareed Zachariah wrote a piece uh, that is immediately designed to set off red flags in the discerning reader, okay? Uh, because it was a talk with a series of unnamed CEOs. We didn't know who they were. We didn't know how many, which in Washington journalistic history is often a setup for something approaching fiction. And I, I, he's a good writer. I don't want to suggest that, but it was an odd setup. We don't know who they are. Don't know what they do. Uh, don't know how many of them there were. But like characters in a science fiction movie, they spoke with one voice and they thought with one mind. And what they thought is this. They thought, um, Okay, the, the private companies, uh, some of which they represented, are sitting on nearly $2 trillion in cash. They're basically hoarding it. And that's because of insecurity about the economy, which even uh, Zakaria acknowledges. But somehow in his piece, all these C hive mind CEOs agreed that there was another reason they weren't spending it, a kind of secret reason, if you will. And the secret reason they weren't spending it was because they, they think deep down inside Barack Obama is anti-business. Now, they all admire them, according to the piece, every single one of them, uh, unanim unanimously, but they all think he's quote-unquote anti-business. So uh, what I wrote about was that, that Fareed Zakaria, while he's a bright guy who's written on some interesting things, is the perfect barometer for the inside Washington policy uh, bubble. And that what he was really doing was saying, look, people, we know, we're smart enough to know that stimulus is needed, but it's politically impossible, which is something he says in the piece. And of course, when they say it's politically impossible, they're helping to make it politically impossible. So let's listen to these guys who are holding on to tons of cash, and then let's put words in their mouth. Why does he say they are holding on to the cash? Well, he says, of course, a primary reason is because of insecurity about the economy. But then he says that they just don't trust Barack Obama because they think he's anti-business. And, you know, my response... So, but let me just make sure. sure. So does that mean that they're holding it 
punitively? Because they're like, no, fearfully. Right. Oh, either fearfully or politically. And, and, and you're right on the, uh, you know, you're, you're right on the money because what I wrote was, you know, having worked in that world, if they could make money cutting loose that cash today, it wouldn't matter if Trotsky yeah. was in the White right. House painting it red. They'd be writing checks all day long. So, and the other thing I pointed out in the piece is that consumer spending is down and consumer saving is up, and they're both for the same reason, which you know, is I they don't trust a, the economy. I talked to a series of consumers. I can't tell you who they were. Right, right. right. Or uh, how many. Yeah. How many. Um, but they all tell me that Obama's a lefty, and that's why they're right, I have, at Walmart right now. Well, I, I did point point out in the piece that one advantage the consumers had over the CEOs was that the consumers at least don't have to take phone calls from Fareed Zakaria while they're trying <laughs> to do their household f budgeting. So, All right, now it, this brings up a host of enormously important issues in Washington now. But right. Before we get to that, I just want to double down on what you said, uh, Richard. It's hilarious to think that uh, you've got businessmen across the country who think, oh, you know, we could be making a lot of money. But we don't want to, right? Because <laughs> Obama is, you know, we're mad at Obama for being anti-business. He's hurt our feelings. He's hurt so our just to show Obama, we're not going to make any money. Right. Exactly. Exactly right. And the other piece of it is that they told uh, they told Fareed that um, they don't like regulation. Well. When are you going to get a businessman, a CEO, to tell you he likes regulation? But somehow. Even though we've had regulation before, when the climate is good, they spend money. Now, here's the other piece of the piece, which is you have to go back to the source material to realize that, that uh, actually short-term lending, which businesses need to operate, suddenly shut down in 2008 because the banks had gambled all that money away and couldn't lend it. So the real reason these guys who are in non-financial companies, meaning not banks, the real reason these guys are hoarding cash is because they're afraid when they need to buy inventory or whatever else they need to spend on and they need a short-term loan, they the can. banks will have gambled it away again. So it's their distrust of Wall Street, not their distrust of Obama, that's really driving why they're holding on to this, uh, this cash. You know, you said businesses are usually against regulation. Now, there's a reason for that. It's because it's the ref making calls saying, hey, you need to spend more money to make sure you're doing things right so you don't right. pollute, people don't die on your job, etc. So it's like saying uh, the Chicago Bulls don't like it when you call fouls on them. Yeah, of course they don't like it, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't <laughs> right. call fouls and we shouldn't have refs. So it's absurd to say, well, you know what? Uh, Bulls think that the refs are anti-Bulls. Right. And, and so that's why they're not scoring any points. So think about the setup. <laughs> think about the way that, uh, that Fareed Zakaria and therefore the whole uh, Washington community is setting this up. We realize stimulus would, more stimulus would be a good idea, don't get us wrong, but it's politically impossible and the only other guys with cash that might stimulate the economy don't like liberals and don't like regulation, so I guess we have to throw those guys over the you know, side of the boat to get the cash loose. It's a very structured uh, way to lead us to a certain conclusion. Isn't there, though, a, uh, there seems to be, if this is true, and again, I totally take your point that it's this selective reading of a few people who we called and we don't even know whether it's two or nine and we don't know who they are. Um, uh, there seems to be somewhere in this, if you're just talking politics, that forget about the value of that $1.8 trillion, um, the stimulus value of it. There's some political winning in here for Obama. I mean, if that there is this much distrust among the CEOs of America in him, that, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a I would think, a, something that uh, at least plenty of people, uh, plenty of voters uh, would like to hear. That's, it, a, that's a really interesting point. Let me jump in there because okay. um, a couple of days ago, uh, Republicans fed the press uh, some uh, memos, et cetera, from, again, the so-called business community saying we're really mad at uh, the Democrats, right, yeah. and the banking community, et cetera. Right. And they fed that to Politico and they fed it to the Washington Post. And then there was an interesting article about how they fed it to them, right? And what the, what the Democrats did was, for, and which is rare in there, right, you know, yeah, in covering right. the Democrats, they said, thank you very much. Yeah, right. We appreciate that. Thank you for painting us as right. anti-banking, anti-big business, et cetera. We'll take it. And, yeah, so you want to be the guys associated with the top bankers, et cetera? Right there. John Boehner, John Cornyn, et cetera, the Republicans. So 
Yeah, uh, it's a point really well made. Shockingly, the Democrats have caught on to that point. So they like that, that mm -hmm. idea being thrown out there. But that's going to lead into a conversation a little later about how the Republicans have used that to collect apparently a $200 million war chest from the business community. And that affects, right. that's bad news for Democrats. But I want to get back to the Washington bubble for a second. It is, it's a magical thing, you know, where you can take a guy like Fried Zachariah, who's obviously smart, you know, obviously knows what he's talking about, it, it, it studied, bright, et cetera, get all the adjectives, right? I think, uh, and, and in some, many cases, uh, unafraid. Yeah, it, it right. called he out stepped Afghanistan. Out on Afghanistan which right. was, uh, you know, and, and he stepped out on many things, and he called right. out Bush on a lot of things later. Right. Now, he was also in favor of the Iraq War, don't get me wrong, and I've disagreed with Zachary on a lot of things. Right. But it's okay to disagree and say the guy's really bright, right? But even for him, there's something in the water where they just get these talking points that just sprout up. And now I've seen this anti business uh, line in approximately a dozen articles over the last two weeks. Right. So somebody's feeding it into the Washington bubble, and everybody's picking it up. All the oh, anti-business. Obama's anti-business. 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 I mean, from a political point of view, I would, I, I, I'd pick up the ball. I'd run with it. But I, I hear you. But here's the downside. He won't. Well, well, but there's one my downside fear. to it, though, because then the Limbaugh's, et cetera, are going to take that and go. You see, that's why we're in the recession. Yeah, I know. But because that, Obama's well, no, anti-business and he ruined the economy. But Jack and I, and I'll defer to Richard here. But won't. I mean, I mean, this is, and I'm surprised you're making this point, but Limbaugh and Hannity and O'Reilly, they're going to blame him for the, for the recession through 2012, no matter what. Right. I, I would say this. I would say the people that I'm worried about are not the Limbaugh's and Hannity's. We know right. what they're going to say. It's the blue dogs. It's the blue dog Democrats who have already, you know, the White House loves to use them as the bad cop in the scenario. Hey, I'd let you go, but those blue dogs want me to book you. You know, that, that's the game as it's being played already. And, and the blue dog dogs can be very obstructionist. And if they really start to buy this, you know, the president's a little too anti-business. We got to start pushing back. Then you're going to see two things happen. Fewer Democrats come November. And the ones that are still there, a lot of them are going to resist doing the things that needs, need to be done. So that's what worries me. And no, that's a great point, and that, dom that has a domino effect. Then it goes to Rahm Emanuel, Rahm Emanuel gets panicked, he says we're going to lose all the House seats, we're going to lose the House and can't get anything done. Or goes to Obama, and Obama, you know, oh my God, they called me into business, oh my God, I'm so scared. I don't okay, 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 I'll cut, I'll cut the, uh, into the deficit, I'll cut Social Security, what do you need me to do? Stimulus spending is apparently politically impossible. See, because don't right. lose sight of that. The ultimate policy objective for the conservatives is don't do stimulus spending, because right. if you do, it might actually help the economy, and that would hurt Republican chances of getting reelected, and that would help Obama, etc. So can they pressure Obama to do exactly what they want by planting stories like this about how he's anti-business, exactly. and he better, and it's politically impossible to do stimulus spending, so he better not do that again. The only thing I would challenge about what you just said is that I'm not so sure that Rahm Emanuel ever panics. I think it's more like, can I use this? But other than that, I basically agree with, with what you said. And the flip side to this argument, if it's politically impossible to do stimulus spending, then it becomes, well, isn't it politically necessary to do Social Security cutting? So, you know, this is all part of a kind of global agenda of, a global national agenda of uh, wealth redistribution, as forbidden as that topic, topic is. So, yeah, I think there is something very structured going on here. It's very much like, I, I also mentioned in the, in the uh, Fareed Zakaria piece that, is it Zakaria or Zakaria? Uh, it well, in the In the Fareed, it, here it does. <laughs> in, in, the, in, in this piece, I mentioned that he also, uh, back when everyone was trying to figure out how to address the stimulus, did a piece about how the real reason for the economic collapse was we greedy consumers who wanted more, 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 and were just living high on the hog as if bankers were just kind of reluctantly giving out second mortgages and, 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 and all these sorts of uh, uh, specious loans, uh, that it's really the greedy consumers, we the American people who are at fault, which had a similar purpose, political purpose, which is to create a climate that would say it's okay to bail out 
Wall Street without doing something to address the people who are underwater on their homes. So maybe it's all coincidence. Maybe it's what they used to call a conspiracy of shared values, but it all falls in line very nicely. You know, real quick, uh, and I think and you mentioned that we'll get to this, but what this conversation has done, and it's not some brainiac conversation, has really crystallized uh, politically exactly what the problem regarding financial reform is for Democrats and the, 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 the reach out, the outreach that has to be done uh, to blue dogs, uh, the, the, the fear of running with, yeah, fine, yeah, we're fighting the bankers, because then at that moment, what you alluded to, is the $200 million war chest that right. the Republicans have raised, and then the natural uh, uh, fear that Democrats are going to have, which is we got to get some of that money. We can't give up all that money. We don't take any seats, so we can't really run with that. We're against the banks, and we can't. I mean, I, I'm well, simplifying what, it, but then we can't no, that's, have the that's, exact. I mean, that's exactly it. That's the problem you have. That's why they make the sacrifices. Uh, or the sellouts, as you would say, uh, that progressives don't want them to make. No, that's exactly what the problem is. We're going to discuss that problem uh, when we come back. But before we go, just one last point, I think, to tie all this up. Look, the reason they pushed the greedy consumer line, it th was, it's not that some consumers weren't greedy. Of course they were. Sure. A lot of people bought houses that they shouldn't have bought and maybe bought plasma yeah. TVs they shouldn't have bought. Two for two. <laughs> You're right, <laughs> yeah. we, right yeah. here, right? Yeah. I don't have the credit to... for the plasma TV now. Just By the that. way, I'm, I'm about to buy an iPad I shouldn't buy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, but it, as far as the houses are concerned, they got encouraged to do that Correct. because the banks made so much more money. At the, so when you go to fix the problem, it isn't like, how do we fix the morality and the character of the American people? No, you fix the system, and the system was rigged on purpose by the banks because they stood to gain more money that way, and we've explained that a lot on this show. But look, to uh, uh, Richard's point there, part of the reason they're pushing that is that so they go, oh, look, you guys were all screwed it up, right? It's your fault. So since you were so greedy, et cetera, now we got to balance the budget. And in order to balance the budget, well, of course, we can't do cut taxes. We can't cut defense. we got to cut your Social Security. But you had it coming, okay? Right. And the Social Security, that's the last piggy bank. That's what they're going after right now with the Deficit Commission. Now, when you fight against, if you fight against that, and Obama hasn't, he's the one that appointed the Deficit Commission and stacked it with 14 out of 18 fiscal conservatives. But if you fight against that, then you're going to have to deal with the $200 million. But as we're going to talk about in the next segment, turns out he didn't fight against it, and he's going to fight against the $200 million anyway. Right. That's, <laughs> as we all knew, as we all knew was going to happen. And at some point, we should talk more about Social Security, too, because they're walking on landmines. If they think they, if, if Obama thinks he can split the difference on Social Security and just cut it a little, and that will be okay... He's going to blow himself and his whole party up come November. Absolutely. So let's talk about that war chest when we come back. What can we do about it? Uh, and what should be the de Democratic strategy uh, to try to avoid it or to take it on? Young Turks. All right, back on TYT. Jenk, Richard Eskow, Ben Mankiewicz. Uh, and uh, last segment we were telling you about this $200 million that the GOP apparently says that they are going to it's not raising for the GOP, it's raised by GOP-associated groups. And, and it, it apparently is going to go almost purely to Republican causes. So let me tell you some of the people that are involved, Before or organizations. This, first, a bigger story, 33 minutes. 33 minutes until Le, uh, LeBron. Until LeBron announces that he's going to play for the Clippers. Uh, actually, 43 minutes, because he's a, apparently he's going to announce it 10 minutes into the show. Right, I understand. Okay. But it's going to be obvious when the show begins that it's the Clippers. Continue. Cavs. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking... Cavs, please. It's going to play here in L.A. No. Everyone knows it. No, no, you're <laughs> almost right. California, Sacramento Kings. That's where he's <laughs> A wild card. Yeah, <laughs> didn't see it coming. All right, so now uh, $200 million raised by uh, these groups. They say they're raising it. We'll see if they actually do. But that's the memo that's out in the news today. Uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, pitching in with $75 million. That's the largest uh, of the group. And then American Crossroads, which is run by Carl Rove, uh, says they're going to raise $52 million. And then you go down the list. And when has Carl Rove ever lied about anything? No, no, no. He says 52. Boy, it's 52. Apparently, people were making fun of uh, American Crossroads because in May, after bragging about how much money they were going to raise, they raised $0. Uh, but then they say in June, they raised $8.5 million. So, you know, if that's true, uh, then they could probably get to $52 million. 
Well, you know, in the blues tradition, the crossroads is where you go to sell your soul to the devil. So I wonder if they consulted that history when they picked their name. But if so, they should be coming up with more cash than they've been able to. Oh, well, just a thought, just a thought. I you know, hear you on that, and yeah. they might be. So, and then some of the other groups are American Action Network, National Republican Trust Pack, Faith and Freedom Coalition, Americas for Job Security, Freedom Works, Campaign for Working Families. So you know that has nothing to do with working families. Well, my brain shut down at Americans for Job Security. I just locked on that and froze. Okay. Um, Heritage Action and Family Research Council all put together uh, almost all of that money. In fact, as far as we can tell, all of that money is going to go to Republicans running in 2010. Now, to give you a size of how big uh, that uh, chunk of money is, it's more than all special interest groups raised, not the politicians themselves, not what they spend, but outside groups. Uh, $37 million more than all of those combined in 2008, which was a monumental presidential election. This is just a midterm election. So when they plop this onto the table, they are basically telling the Democrats, we just got big business to just come in here and buy these elections. But what are you going to do about it? Doesn't I mean and and you know the the idea in for 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 decades nearly a century big business has generally given its money to Republican to Republicans certainly since FDR and prior to that but but overwhelmingly since FDR but that overwhelmingly is always like, I always was led to believe before I started actually, you know, reading and checking numbers that that was going to meant like it was going to be, you know, 90 to 10. 80. But it always, when you look at the numbers, it's always 57-43. It's 56-44. I mean, they give to both. How do we, all of, all of these companies, all of them, everything in the Chamber of Commerce, all of their money is going to go to Republicans? Well, they always give hedge, hedge your bet money right. to That's the what I'm Democrat. saying, yeah. And I, presumably they'll continue to do that. Otherwise, you wouldn't have seen uh, so many Democrats, including Barbara Boxer in the Senate, saying they want auto dealers to be exempted from the Consumer Financial Protection Bill. Clearly, they're counting on the guy back home who, who runs Joey's Ford right. to raise some bucks for them, and he will. Right. And well, you know, that's a great point by Ben. So it makes me think, oh, what's... Oh, mine isn't. That's no, yours is been. mediocre, but yeah, that's okay. all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, better luck next time. No, but you raised a lot of good points in the last segment, so oh, you're right. still, you know, I'm high just making a very slow comeback. <laughs> so, but what, what, what wound up happening is, you know, it was 57-43 uh, for the Republicans for a long time. Democrats actually took the advantage over the last four years or so, and business interests actually were giving a little bit more to the Democrats. Now, theoretically, over financial reform, health care reform, et cetera, business interests got pissed. And so they are now back to largely being on the Republican side. But, Ben, you're right. This is a fishy story. There's no way the Chamber of Commerce raises $75 million and gives it 100% of the Republicans. That's mental. They would yeah. never do that. Yeah, I mean, I understand Karl Rove's crossroads. I got it. I right. know, we all know where that money's going. Right. Um, so then that makes me raise. think, why is this story planted? Right. Well, because... right. Absolutely. Well, good, great point. Uh, you know, if you think about it, it, there, it has a very close relationship to the Fareed Zakaria story. Exactly. Which is we we have a business unfriendly government, and they need to become more business friendly, or they're going to lose. I think that's what it is. I think it's a veiled threat by those same you know corporate interests, et cetera, saying, "Hey, you know what? We've been trying to be nice with you guys, right?" But, you know, we've had it up to here, and we could raise $200 million to beat all of you. So blue dogs, et cetera, everybody else, get in line right frickin' now. And it's been, it's, and, and when I first read it, I didn't quite make the connection that Ben did, uh, but I thought this is definitely meant to intimidate, right? And when you add in the point that it can't possibly be true, right. then you think, well, what's well, the point? It, it must be to intimidate to some degree. It's like those arguments. I mean, I'm sure they are going to get two hundred million dollars if they. I mean, that maybe that part may be true. Maybe they'll be a little short of that. But it's it, it's essentially those arguments uh, about when you fear, you know, uh, when you are talking about running for office and uh, uh, when you plan what the other side is going to say. Oh no, they're going to say that we talk about it all the time. What Russia is going to say. What uh, you know? What Hannity is going to say, and then more reasonably, you know, uh, what are uh, what are middle of the roaders going to say? What are independents going to say? And and it always when when pundits talk about it, it, it doesn't suppose what what you're going to say. You're going to have an answer, and you're going to say something about them too. This is an argument, like in court. These are two lawyers. Yeah, the prosecution's going to do this. Yeah, well, you're going to have a defense. 
and you're going to argue too, and you're going to cross-examine those witnesses. So, okay, yeah, maybe they're going to raise $193 million. We're not going to raise none, you know. Right, and, and right now, on that point, uh, the Democrats are outraising the Republicans when it comes to the actual uh, Democratic groups, like the, for the House and the, for the Senate, and for, the, generally speaking, not in every race, obviously, it varies by race, but overall, Democrats raising more money for the actual politicians. Okay. Right. These are outside groups. So, Ben, of course, that's the counterpunch. But that goes to the point of the story, which, and this is from the Huffington Post, uh, and uh, the follow-up is, what are the Democrats going to do to react? And, of course, one of the uh, possibilities that was raised is uh, basically panic and say, okay, business interest, no, 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 no. Uh, right. give, give it to us, too. W w what do you need? What do you need? Right. Because right. it's what politically you, impossible to do, do anything to else. It's all... Financial reform bill, right? What because right. exactly, because right. it hasn't quite passed yet. It's and so, but that leads me to my thought on well, maybe that. Of course, I'm going to say this that that's not the right answer. Maybe the right answer is the complete opposite. To say, hey, listen, you know, God, we were so soft on Wall Street in this Wall Street in the financial reform, and you know, we gave them this and we gave them that, and we gutted the derivatives thing, we gutted the Volcker rule, we took out the Franken Amendment. And none of it was good enough. Right. It's never going to be good enough. They would have threatened to take the money and give it to the Republicans if we did even one of these reforms, right? right. And they would have said they would have cried, Uncle. They did. We was incredibly weak, and they still cried, Uncle, from the top of the mountain, right? And they told every press guy they have in Washington, Oh, he's anti-business, and we're coming to get him, and you know. Right. So maybe Obama should have said, Hey, you know what? Okay, here's the lesson I learned. Okay, they're going to call me socialist no matter what. They're going to call me anti-business. They're going to raise $200 million against me no matter what. So why don't I actually do the real reform so then I can raise money like I did in 08 from the American people, which was totally successful, energize my base, energize the unions, and get actual voters to vote. Definitely. Instead, he's in the middle ground. Nobody's energized. And they raised $200 million against him anyway, maybe. And the problem is... First of all, that most of Obama's money actually came from corporate contributions, not small contributions, in the end. And uh, he raised more money from Wall Street than any candidate in American political history, including his opponent, which, again, is because they knew he was likely to win. Um, so he somehow, I, I think well, if a person gets elected president, it's only understandable that they have a very high sense of their own ability to persuade people to their point of view. And I think he really feels he can put it all together in a new, new and unique way. I don't see him leading the party, particularly with the team of advisors he's got around him now, to try anything different than, frankly, what our worst fears would tend to be. So, Ben, did, does he get caught in the middle then? Is he hosed? Well, I think I don't, I'm getting caught in the middle. I think he likes being in the middle. I think that's but is where, that a wrong right. strategy? Well, I mean, it's a wrong strategy, I think, to look at it simply. I think Richard is right. I mean, this is where he's comfortable, so I don't think it, he didn't think of it as a wrong strategy, even if you presented it as the way you presented it, if you had a room with him, for if you were alone with him for 10 minutes. Well, first of all, you'd end up playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> but if you chose your time alone with him to talk policy, um, you know, in general, I mean, obviously, and I know you you know you're oversimplifying it, but it, you're talking about a general way of going through life where you don't have to worry about forming a coalition of, of 218 members of the House and sometimes absurdly 60 senators. Um, but, you know, we saw it a little bit yesterday, a perfect example in the CNN uh, bureau chief, uh, the Middle East bureau chief, uh, whose name I'll mispronounced, Azra or... Nasser, I think. Nasser, yeah. excuse me, I'm sorry, who was, uh, who was fired. But she did the apology. She did everything right. She was like, I shouldn't have said that. It's complicated, and here's the explanation. It was a brilliant explanation saying why this guy who had passed away, the, the uh, Hezbollah, the no longer influential uh, Hezbollah leader, uh, had been important and why he, was a, he had done some good things and why he had done some terrible things. And they fired her anyway. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in a sense, why apologize? Just explain and there's, you know, and, and from Obama's point of view, that's true, too. But he's comfortable in that little middle ground. He always has been. Uh, well, I agree 100 percent with that. I mean, that's why he's uh, reported to have said that he has a man crush on Tim Geithner, the guy who has a man crush. I mean, not, hey, I like him and I agree with man crush. That means 
I love someone who it's, appeases the establishment. It's literally right. the worst man crush ever. E ever. Ever. Yeah. In recorded history. Right? I, I, I just want to it's go on worse record than Carl as being Rose. deeply disturbed by that information, yeah. which is new to me. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm troubled, that, frankly. I, <laughs> no, because, uh, I think I'll need some help. No, <laughs> I, I, when I first yeah. read that, I wanted to, I vomited a little in my mouth. I is mean, there a different Tim Geithner? Because maybe that's the issue. <laughs> because look, Tim he, Gertner. Yeah. <laughs> Because Carl Rose man crush on, on Bush, we kind of get it, right, you know. Sure. Yeah. But so so I agree with you, Ben, that it's in his character. He and this is what I talk about all the time. Whichever uh, room he's in, in a matter of speaking, he's going to find the middle, right? Right. So if he's in a room, uh, which is the whole country, when he was running for president, he finds the middle of the country, which was pro change, let's go get him, progressive, etc. When he's in Washington, he finds the middle, which is way more right-wing than the rest of the country. Right. So I get that concept, but he, Ben brought up another good point, which is what we get all the time, blue dog Democrats. So is he right about that? And is Obama and Rahm Emanuel said are right to be concerned? So the blue dog Democrats come to him and say, I'm not going to vote for financial reform because I can't raise money from the American people like you can. You have the name recognition, you have the organization, etc. I'm just going to flat out lose with, no, with not enough money in my district. How do you answer that question? Well, I think the answer is that, well, first of all, I, it varies district by district and blue dog by blue dog. But these are guys, look, we have Rahm Emanuel now running the White House who deliberately went out in a lot of these swing states and recruited the most right-wing candidates he could to run, even when they didn't necessarily poll the best. So we have a lot of blue dogs who are ideologically right where they want to be. And where they want to be is fairly, fairly far to the right. So I would flip the question around and say, to what extent should the president be appeasing these guys? And to what extent, when they block him on something having to do with financial reform and something that he genuinely wants because Timmy wants it, you know, something in financial reform that they block, something in health care they block, you know, he's called the liberals in en masse in, from Congress and kick their ass. He's never done that ever, the blue dogs. So the question has to be, to what, is that because he really thinks he can't persuade them or he might lose them? Or is that because they're where his heart is? Uh, does he need a better strategy for managing this? No, that's a, that's, that's a great point. But I think that's, I mean, a lot of that is, is human nature. It's why you can take out your worst frustrations on your dog because he never leaves. I mean, it's why right. Bill Clinton had the sister soldier moment. It's why you can, because you, that, those, you, you know those people are with you. Um, you know, so I mean, and throughout, as you know, Richard, through, for Democrats for, you know, decades and decades and decades since the party split there and over, over civil rights in the 1950s and 60s, there has been this sort of giant compromise that we have always had to make with right-wing Democrats for policy decision after policy decision. And it's very rare that a president has brought the sort of social, moral, or economic hammer down and been able to bring those guys in. More often it's, what do I need to do to get you guys? Not, you are with me or there's hell to pay because the fear is, no, no, the hell, the hell will be paid by me, right. not but by you. So let me address that then because uh, I think Richard's right. We, you, in the first segment you talked about it and you kind of alluded to it here, good cop, bad cop, right? And he says, oh my God, the blue dogs made me do it. When in reality, he wanted to do that anyway. I mean, the public option was a perfect example. Right. Oh, I would love to do the public option, but the blue dogs wouldn't let me do it. My ass. You made a deal on that, you know, And you know what I wrote it at the time, and I came on this show and talked about it. I, I wrote when Joe Lieberman was the last guy blocking the public option, if he didn't exist, the White House would have had to invent him. That, that's exactly, I think that's exactly right. Uh, certainly on that issue and on many other issues. So, uh, but it, to Ben, to your point then, so what could does he have nothing he can do because they're going to raise the money and then what et cetera? No, if he wanted to, if he didn't want to play good cop bad cop, and he really wanted to press on this stuff, for example, Blanche Lincoln, right, comes up and and says, all right, well, what am I going to do? I got to raise money. Now she might be a bad example because she actually wound up having a great derivatives reform amendment, but that's partly because she was pressed by a progressive. He could say, look, either you're going to get your ass kicked, and by the way, the way that turned out is. What it, Rahm Emanuel said, no, we have to back the establishment, uh, you know, the more conservative, Blanche Lincoln, over the more progressive, Bill Halter. And you look at the polls, Bill Halter was within nine points of the Republican. Blanche Lincoln is like 30 points behind the Republican. 
So it's they're wrong on the politics. They're wrong on it. I know, but that's happened. There, you could count on 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 half of one hand the number of times a president has has not backed a sitting senator in his party. Right, but even even if you wanted to do that, you say to them, okay, look. I'm going and, to do and by fundraising. By the way, he didn't exactly campaign. They didn't exactly pull out all the stops for Blanche Lincoln in any way. Yeah, because they were afraid she was going to lose, and they didn't sure. want to seem right. like right. lose right. political yeah. credibility. Bill Clinton went down there, but right? He yeah. pulled out all the stops. Right. But look, we, we've seen it in West Wing. We've seen it in in <laughs> in, in, in in the real world, and it's true because because I <laughs> mentioned West Wing here. Obviously, it's partly comedy, but partly because the character of Josh uh, Lyman is based on Rahm Emanuel, right? And you see the, the guys who work with them wrote it, right? And what they say is, look, I'm either going to do fundraising for you or I'm going to do fundraising for your opponent. Now, you say you've got a trouble with money because the corporate money is going to, to the Republicans and you can't win without it. Well, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you raise that money. I'm going to come to your district and I'm going to campaign for you. But you've got to be with me on strong reform. Or, or if you're not with me, well, then good luck to you, right? Then you're almost certainly going to lose. But this gets back to what, what Ben said earlier, and I know it's Ben, Ben, Ben all the time. But no, this gets back, <laughs> which is, is that's assuming, again, that, that what he wants is strong reform. I'm not convinced that what he's wanted in either of these cases is really strong reform. And, and that's what I'm driving at. Okay. That's exactly yeah. it. Because if he wanted to, he could go down that road. He could fight against the $200 million in that way. You know, if it really exists. Well, I, but I, I, instead, he's going in the opposite direction, going, oh, what can I do? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I don't know what he wants. I really don't. My hunch is I think he wants stronger reform than you guys think, but I certainly don't think that he wants as strong reform as, as, as many liberals want, or as many as people want to believe that this guy who was the symbol of hope and change was going to bring about. But I think if you're going to do a lot of the things that you wish he would do, you really have to be prepared to get your ass kicked. I mean, you said at the beginning of the entertainment hour, oh, Cleveland, boo-hoo, you lost. Well, I mean, <laughs> then uh, if LeBron doesn't sign, well, I mean, yeah, okay, if Barack Obama were prepared to say, okay, yeah, well, boo-hoo, Barack Obama, you did the right thing, but you lost the election. Mm -hmm. Well, he's not prepared to say that. And, and in his, to his some defense, neither has anyone else before him. No, but you know what's so frustrating is, I, I think m most people understand that, but there's so many cases where th what we would probably among ourselves consider the right policy decision is clearly the right political decision if you look at the polling. Whether it's social security, well, I, I whether it's that. getting the banks, whether it's public option or other aspects of healthcare, and yet, so we're not talking about a guy saying, hey, you know what, you live in that fantasy world of ideal policy. I got to play in the real world of politics. It's uh, the other way around. He's misjudging the politics of it. That's what's driving me crazy. Well, not just the policy. I'm not an idealist floating around in the clouds going, oh, I wish he would I know, just rain he, down lollipops. But he's, he's misjudging the, <laughs> like the politics. And I, it's funny because I think we all agree to some extent that he's misjudging the politics. But he's li it's like the Nielsen ratings. Like you're misjudging the politics in a land where they're all misjudging the politics. So you almost have to operate in the playing field of where everybody's misjudging the politics. That's but, exactly what you don't have to do. Okay. What Dick Cheney said was, I'm going to bring you real change. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this political spectrum all the way to the right. Oh, they say it's uh, you know politically impossible to torture people. Oh yeah, step aside, Butch. Watch me, right? They say it's politically impossible to invade a country for no goddamn reason. Oh yeah, step aside, Butch. Watch me. Well, I mean, it goes on and on. Well, but we, Obama buys into that hype we talked about in the first segment that all of this is politically impossible. Well, we don't, and that's when he's defeated. Well, uh, my point is going to be totally hypothetical because we'll never know. But George Bush ended with a. a, a, a uh, approval rating of below 30 percent and if we hadn't been fighting a war that he had started that we were not hating yet uh, he would have lost uh, he would have suffered an incumbent defeat that made Jimmy Carter look remarkably uh, competitive so yeah Dick Cheney did it but barring he did it because the war and September 11th gave him this sort of ability to do it and I think George Bush would have gotten slaughtered even by John Kerry had we not been in this. But that's exactly my point. Dick Cheney, we well, only agree. Did it. He did it because of the situation. Right, but in. I hear you, but we, we didn't agree with Cheney's policy. But look, he took it strong. 
and it worked. Well, I think and, it worked and, and, because and, of the situation. And, and just another point, you know, the Iraq war was unpopular before the invasion, and then it was incredibly popular once we did it, but but people forget that. It was an unpopular was policy. Right? Is it my it, recollection? Is, is that no, it was no, it, it was unpopular really? when, uh, originally, and uh, before it happened, and then everybody rallied around a 92% approval, and I felt like an alien, the, a lot of us did, but, but it was originally unpopular. But the things we wish that Obama would do are politically popular even now, even before the president gets behind him. So it's not analogous. I mean, yes, it's analogous in the sense that Jenk is saying, you know, why doesn't he act boldly the way Bush and Cheney did? But they were acting boldly in favor of policies that were a, originally not popular, and then B, horribly executed yep. and incompetent. So, but they also right. imagine what you could do if you applied it to policies also, that people actually like. I, right. Look, I agree in general. I, I just want to point out the difficulty in general, as we've seen, by the way, because this is not true just with Barack Obama. The same, you know, progressives, liberals have the exact same frustration with Bill Clinton, by and large, who, by the way, caused a lot of this, as we now know. Um, uh, and, <laughs> and the so they were kind of right. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no, I don't disagree with that. But I mean, I've had a problem with just about every Democratic candidate, save George McGovern, um, that the situation the Democrats in is just so much more complicated. Well, yeah, you want to look at it as George Bush and Dick Cheney did this on an unpopular policy that then got completely poorly executed. There was an incredibly simple theme for it, which was... America, yeah, and if you don't like it, you hate us, and it's not, and that resonates, and it particularly yeah, here's resonated, what resonated after September 11th. Here's what would have resonated. Bankers, boo. <laughs> Maybe. Right? Here's something else. Here's something <laughs> I'm else. coming for them. I'm I, coming. I, right? I, I just did a piece on the polling about Social Security. Republicans tried to privatize Social Security. They say they'll do it again. Boehner made those idiotic comments about uh, cutting Social Security to pay for Afghanistan. Uh, the polling is staggering. Seven out of ten people yeah. strongly would dislike any politician that tries to attack Social Security. The feeling nobody should cut it for any reason. It not, should not, you know, on and on. Just the numbers are dazzling. What does Obama do? He appoints a commission with, with fiscal conservatives on it and gives away the one issue in an off year that he could use to protect some seats, which is they're all coming for your support. Does, all it's he, insane. All he ever does is give him the queen. You know, it's because he's bought into Washington of what's politically impossible, what he has to do, uh, and uh, that the right wing is always right. And Just real quick, did he appoint a commission or did he appoint a commission? <laughs> he, he took it stronger. He pointed it strong. I'm going to appoint a commission. <laughs> Take that if with he, a bunch of conservatives on it. If he had done, no. <laughs> if he had done it that way, Ben, then I would have been in favor. Uh, of course, uh, who would? I respect strength. <laughs> okay. All right, we got to take a quick break here, and then we got to come back and see if the Republicans are going to flip on Afghanistan. That's very interesting. Come right back.